Greetings to all of you, our Area 312 crew, and also to anyone new who may be joining us today. We have quite a treat in store for you today. Uh, the band that we are talking to today, uh, this band went on to become one of the biggest bands in Christian rock history. And uh, we're gonna be talking to the original band today. Now, over the course of time, this band put out 24 albums, sold over 10 million records, won four Grammys, 10 Dove Awards. They were the first Christian rock band to be inducted into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. And they're also the first Christian rock band to have their memorabilia put into the Hard Rock Cafe. This is a band that really needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. This Today is the original Petra, and we've got three of the guys with us. We've got John DeGroff, we've got Bill Glover, we've got Greg Hogue, and a little bit later, we're going to be joined by Bob Hartman. So for right now, we're going to start talking about some of what these guys have been doing since the days of Petra. Like Mike said, welcome, gentlemen. It's truly our honor. And I also want to say, friends, uh, joining Mr. John DeGroff is Curtis George. Curtis, welcome, buddy. And Curtis yes. is an excellent drummer. Uh, friends, if you have any of uh, John DeGroff and friends, the Salt albums, Curtis is the exceptional drummer on those albums. So, Curtis, it's an honor to have you too, buddy. Thank you, Kent. So, gentlemen, I just kind of want to break this down a little bit. Um, Mr. Bob's going to be getting joining us a little bit later, but um, I'd like to start out then by talking about the current music that you guys have made. I know you guys have been active since Petra. Um, Dr. Greg, I'd like to start with you, sir, if you don't mind. Um, okay. Post Petra, you performed in a couple different bands that I'm aware of. One was a band called Ransom. And the other one was called Huso, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'd just like to ask you, I remember, Dr. Greg, uh, Huso reading in CCM Magazine. You know, they always used to have little updates and news bits and all. And I can remember as far as back as is about the mid to latter 80s of talking about that band. Um, would you mind just sharing the style that Ransom and Huso were? and telling us the durations of those bands. Well, right after Petra, I started a band called Ransom uh, with a singer that we had considered in Petra named Rick Ledesma. And Bill, you were with us for a while in Ransom, weren't you? Yes. And, uh, and a, a friend of mine named Carl Burroughs. And we, went, we played and we practiced in uh, uh, Van Wert, Ohio. And we went out and we played a lot, but I think it was the industry was just not ready for something like what we did. I think it, it just wasn't it just wasn't God's will. But I did that and had a lot of a lot of fun doing that. And so I went back. I decided the only thing I ever was really any good at, other than playing guitar, was studying. I could fake both of them. Say so, but so I went back to school and. Um, Gosh, I couldn't believe it. I got on the honor roll. I became a, a the secretary of the honor society at chiropractic college. Um, and I just felt like, I tell you what, if it wasn't for Petra, I remember thinking, well, if I can be in a band and God can use me in Petra, 
and he wants me to go back to college, I can do that too. Cause he'll be with me in it just as much. So I did that. And then, uh, but Huso kind of originated at the end of my uh, time in college. And it was just something to do to let off steam and enjoy playing music. And uh, so we did that. And it was called Whosoever Calls Upon the Name of the Lord Shall Be Saved. Yes. But, but at that time in our lives, I think then I was really uh, focusing in on practice, getting my practice built up and treating patients. And it was, you know, I couldn't do any more than that, but just come in and play and go back to work, you know. <laughs> And in the second man, who so they really wanted to do more than that. And so uh, I stepped back because they wanted to go out and uh, play and tour. And I just couldn't do that. So the most fun I've had in the last years was, oh, gosh, it's been 20 some years ago. A friend I had from church when I was younger, Jerry Farrington. Uh, he was going to marry a girl and uh, she got cancer and died. And it just broke his heart. So he didn't come to church or anything. It didn't seem he was gone. And uh, so I, there was this jam session that somebody had caught him, talked him into coming and he played. So he and I hooked up and I went over to his, I thought, I'm going to just go play guitar with him and just be his friend and minister to him. So we would meet every Tuesday. And after the second Tuesday, he said, here, can you play Autumn Leaves? And I said, uh, I don't have any idea how to do anything like that. <laughs> so, so, I went and I, so I went back and I practiced all that week and I came back and played it. And he gave me another one. He gave me another one. And so for a year and a half, he, Jerry taught me how to play jazz guitar. And then we went out and we played at, at local restaurants and played jazz for the rest of my life and I sing like fly me to the moon and I sing all those old jazz songs and play jazz guitar Bill and I played together with Jerry Farrington didn't we Bill yep fine bass player oh yeah fine bass player guitar player and so I've spent a lot of my career uh doing that lately Dr. Greg I'd like to ask you sir because uh, I believe you became a chiropractor in 1989 and so yeah one couldn't help but wonder, my mind... August of 86. Turned. What's... August of 86. 86, okay, I apologize. So, my wheels got to turn, and I'm like, you know, I wonder if Dr. Gray, you know, back in his Petra days and his, and his Huso days, if he's up there rocking, and he's seeing people rocking out to his music, and then he sees a lot of people getting whiplash. And so he becomes, hey, I got an idea, I can become a chiropractor, you know? <laughs> 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 anyway so <clears throat> he's a good one too has he ever has he ever twisted you up like a pretzel mr bill oh yeah <laughs> he helped me a lot <laughs> so mr bill i know that you are still playing drums uh you're you have a, you're in a florida based band right now called bandana so tell us about bandana mr bill where you caught me snacking too <laughs> um I originally came down to Florida to help to be with my mother. She had got married, uh, remarried to her childhood sweetheart, and and he was she was in her eighties, and he lost his, one of his limbs, and so Tammy and I she agreed to come down. I didn't have to twist her arm because she loved it. She loves Florida, but anyway, we came down to be close to her. We got a little mobile home just around the corner from her. And it was a real blessing to do that. And I believe that God rewarded us for that by giving me bandana because I'm uh, playing more now than I ever have in my whole life as far as quantity goes. I'm playing about 150 shows a year down here. And it's all local shows. So I retired off the road and just playing having fun with these guys. Uh, we don't rehearse. We show up for the gig. We play our butts off and then we go home and be with our families. And I'm able to go to church and be a part of the uh, uh, local ministry here at church and play drums in church. And so it's really a blessing. I, I'm paying for my retirement. Um, 
I didn't have much of a social security check because I played music and goofed off most of my life. So, <laughs> you know, I'm now I'm paying for my retirement, you know, and of course, you know what they call, I'm married to a great gal, you know, and she makes good money. So, you know what you, you call a musician or a drummer, guitarist or whatever they may be, but not a wife, don't you? <laughs> Broke. Homeless. Homeless, exactly. <laughs> so, Bill, oh. if I can, if I can ask, what what type of music is this band that you, bandana doing? Are you doing like classic, you know, classic rock covers? Okay. Cream. Uh, we do cream. We do uh, the Doobie Brothers. You know, all of that. Okay. Bob Dylan, um, Neil Young, just just anything that we can sing. None of us can sing like Journey, so we don't do any Journey. And we have a great lead singer and frontman who used to be with Sam the Sham and the Pharaoh, so that helps. <laughs> so that's why we're able to do 150 shows a year without leaving town because he was a big fish in a, in a little bowl here. Mm -hmm. He had two number one uh, hits, worldwide hits, and they come out to hear him do Bully Bully and Little Red Riding Hood over and over and over and over and over again. He's been doing it for 25 years down here, and his band, Bandana, has been voted the number one band down here for 25 years in a row. So that's why, you know, I just, that's why it's a blessing to me. I was in the right place at the right time, just like with, with Petra. We'll discuss that later. We just happen to be in the right place at the right time. It's not anything about us. We just yeah. happen to be there. I believe it was God. Yes, sir. No doubt about that. I've got to ask you, Mr. Bill, you were talking about all those great songs from the classic rock bands that I know and love. I can think of another classic rock band called Argent mm -hmm. that had a great song called God Gave Rock and Roll to You. Do you guys ever play that one? No, we don't. <laughs> we don't have anybody can sing like Greg X Bold, brother. Well, I'm talking. To, I'm talking about uh, Russ Ballard, who wrote the song in Argent. It's mm -hmm. a great song. I love that song. My favorite song that Petra did. Mine too. <laughs> the one that we did not write or have anything to do with. All we did was cover it. I know. I know. I know. But I had to throw that in there. But I will say this, and not to get it, not to put the cart ahead of the horse. But what you guys did to that song, for that song, not to, but for that song, you guys, that introduction, it it's almost orchestral, the way that you guys built that song. Mike and, I, Mike and I were having a discussion months ago about it, and the way you guys started that out with the acoustic, and then you build it up, and I mean, my gosh, John on the bass, I mean, the, the do, 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 you know, and Mr. Bill, I'm hearing your drums, do you remember Greg? Greg had to get out in front of the band and you talk about orchestrate. That's what he did. He he was waving his arms. If you can see me, he was doing it. He was keeping the beat because we were rushing it. I probably my fault. I was probably rushing it. And so Greg actually went out there and conducted us so that we could stay in a groove. You was remember this, that, Greg? Was, yes. Oh, <laughs> So yes. this was you, this was you <laughs> Dr. Greg, that was doing the conducting? Yeah. yeah. Well, tell me about it. Oh, it's fantastic. We kept rushing. Remember, John? And they said, we got to slow it down. You're rushing. You're rushing. So Greg put down his guitar, went out in front of where we could all see him in the middle of the studio and conducted it so that we could see the tempo and all stay together. And he would keep us from rushing it. I really don't remember. That's how we did that song. It was uh, one of the hardest songs, really the hardest song I recorded on both of those albums, the first and the second album, was that song. It was a very difficult song. It yeah. was, uh, I think it, it's an anthem. I think it's a, uh, it's, it's the Christian stairway to heaven, in my opinion. You guys made it your own. You certainly did. And I absolutely loved your rendition. To me, that's the quintessential rendition between even between Argent, I mean, you know, you guys, you guys were so awesome uh, doing that. And I need to get to you, Mr. John. Um, 
Mr. John, you, you, uh, along with Mr. Bill, Dr. Greg, you guys released GHF, and that was circa 2013, is that correct? Well, that's the, um, that's the studio album. Uh, we actually, I had moved back to my hometown in Ohio in 2003 and Bill and Greg called me up and asked me to start playing with them again. They had, they had a band and our first gig that we never played was somewhere up in Michigan. I can't remember the town, but that was recorded live right off of the soundboard. And it didn't sound too Hastings, often. Michigan. Hastings, it, Michigan. Yeah, you're right. And ah. um, what we did was uh, we heard it and figured, okay, uh, let's put this out uh, on a CD, a live CD. It was our very first show after I'd moved back. It was 2004. I moved back in 2003. And um, we called it Honestly Live because there was no way to fix any mistakes in it. So we just, <laughs> just did it. <laughs> Put it out there. There's uh, Greg claims he's got a few copies left in his garage somewhere, but I think I we do. have 100 <laughs> copies made up or something like that. And I've got one or two left. We sold a few of them. It's it's got some bloopers on it, but it's it's got some stuff that uh, Bob or Bill and Greg wrote, and it's some old Petra stuff, and it's it's not bad. And then we did the second one, uh, what 2013, right? Yeah. Okay. And that we did in Greg's office using computer software. And I'm pretty proud of it. It's, uh, you know, for not putting any money into the studio time, it came out sounding pretty well and some good tunes on it. We and that's for you. We used the same mics that we used in Petra, John, to record the drums. Yeah. Really? I don't remember that, but it was, uh, wow. we, um, we were in, we were in Greg's, uh, it was a storeroom with a lot of his his files and uh, a couple of desks and there's just enough room to stand in basically <laughs> to do this. It was like a big closet where we recorded that album. Yeah. So you guys had GHF, God is Forgiven. And at this interval, gentlemen, is there, if somebody is, because I don't know, uh, and we're going to talk about Salt and John DeGroff and friends here in a second, Mr. John. But for GHF, if somebody would like to go purchase, I believe it's Volume 1, what's the best place for them to purchase Volume 1 at? I have I have copies. And um, I know there's probably some stuff out there, but I, I definitely have copies. Uh, Curtis and I have put together a uh, merchandise page for Salt okay. and copies of GHF materials available through that okay so mr john um whenever we air this uh and i think you did mention that you would get those links to me and friends yeah. out there i will put all descriptions uh to, to the links if you want to get some salt or ghf material it'll all be in the description below so i'll be sure yeah, to thank you. mr john i'd like to ask you um about your john de john de Groff and friends the salt albums i know i know your first one came out i believe in 2018 and then your sophomore effort, Trophy Hunting for Unicorns, it was released in, uh, I believe, late 2020. So an interesting aspect to me about SALT is that uh, on, aside from, I know Dr. Greg has played some guitar on those albums, and, and then John Schlitt guesting on vocals. So tell us about SALT, Mr. John, and tell us how uh, John Schlitt came into uh, to be in the fold with doing some material with you. Well, uh, first of all, I got the name Salt from the Matthew 5.13 scripture, you are the salt of the earth. And uh, I've always, I like one word band names because at my age, it's easy to remember. You know, like <laughs> um, my favorite band, yes, you know, Petra. 
Uh, one word names. I can I can remember that. So Saul just seemed like a great name for a Christian band. And I love that uh, that scripture because when Christ calls you the salt of the earth, salt was a very prized commodity in the ancient world. It was also used as a preservative. And so when he's calling you the salt of the earth, he's giving you a lot of value. And he's also kind of giving you a job. You're the We're the preservative. If, if we are the preservative, Christianity and Christians are the preservative, you know, what would this world be without us? So uh, I, there's a kind of a double meaning to that. And I've always thought it'd be a great name for a band. And I've always... I've always been into what's known as progressive rock. In other words, music you can't dance to. Uh, <laughs> I've never been able to find guys who wanted to play it. I mean, I, I've worked with guys who have incredible chops, but just find somebody who has the mindset to play progressive rock is a little different. Then um, Curtis and I play in a three-piece band called the Gary Gerard Group. We both had a gig last night. So both of us, if we seem a little fuzzy right now, that's why. <laughs> But three-piece band, that's how I met him. And what's bizarre is um, we started talking. He's into the bands I grew up with. He's into, yes, he's into King Crimson. He's into Kansas. He's into bands that somebody his age shouldn't even know. And not only does he like that music, he can play it. And then my best friend growing up is a guy named Dan Liu, who is uh, my age. And he's the closest thing I have to a brother. And we were in bands throughout high school, and I've always wanted to work with Dan again. And he's on the second, he's on both Salt albums. He wrote a, uh, even though it's rock, or even though it's uh, prog rock and jazz, Dan wrote a rockabilly tune for the album. It's called Anachoristic Anachorism. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just said, here, I, I want you to have a track all your own, do whatever you want. I don't care. And the guy who was the producer or the uh, owner of Rottweiler Records, Sean Browning, heard the, he heard the instrumental take, and it didn't have lyrics yet. And he said, this needs words. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I didn't write it. Dan Liu did. So put the two of you guys together. So Sean wrote the words and came up with and, and did the vocals. And interesting thing, Sean has a band called Grave Robber, which these guys are a costume band. They make uh, they make the Walking Dead look like GQ models, to put it to put it bluntly. And <laughs> Grave Robber, the name Grave Robber, comes from a Petra song. And one of his drummers was Curtis's uncle, a guy named Dave Oliver. Dave Oliver and Dave and Dave was in the Gerard band. So there's kind of this weird circle again of how everybody knew everybody well sean uh, just sold the grave robber label to a label out of texas called mythic panda and they have both albums now they're christians and um basically salt is the anomaly everything else on rottweiler and mythic panda are very uh thrash metal what some people call barking bands, which I guess is unfair, but that gives you an idea of what they sound like. You know, the really heavy stuff. We're not. We're prog rock and jazz and whatever we want to do. And I keep saying, because it's prog rock, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> which is really basically true. You can use any genre and steal from it and call it prog rock. And we are currently right now starting the writing process for the third album, and one of our goals, uh, we are the only band in in Rottweiler and uh, Mythic Panda who has not played live. We've done this backwards. We did albums, uh, and we have a fan base because of Petra, and but we've never done a live show. So the goal is this year to start the next album, start the third one. Uh, most of the music is written, but we've just got to start the rehearsal process. Uh, Dan Lou's going to have a, a track again. Uh, we have a wonderful keyboard player by the name of John McCorkle, who is just brilliant. Okay, we are back. 
And uh, I'm Mike, along with my co-hosts, Kent and Rex, and we have the original Petra with us today. We have John hey, Gruff, Bill Glover, Bob Hartman, and Gregory Hogue. These guys were the original band that started in 1972. And from 1972 to 1978, this was the original Petra. And uh, we just want to welcome you because this, in 2022 here, we are celebrating 50 years since Petra started. And that's, that's a huge deal, yes. Yes, uh, so much great music has come our way over all these years because of what you four guys set out to do in the beginning. And uh, so I wanna start out by saying, uh, just talking about the name, talking about the name Petra. Um, in the, uh, from the original album here, we have, it says Petra means rock and that's, that's indeed true. So can you guys just talk a little bit about how you came up with the name? How did you come to the name Petra? Were other names considered? Um, just talk about that for a little bit. Okay. Anybody uh, want to chime in there? I remember. Um, I, I remember it was in November when we had just gotten off the stage at Calvary Temple on North Clinton Street. We had jam, and and uh, I remember Bob looked at me and he said, "Okay, I'll do this band," and I and I said, "Well, great," and he goes. And I have a name for it. I said, what's the name? He goes, Petra. So it, Bob came up with the name. Well, we were Bible students at the time. And so we were exposed to a lot of Greek language. And uh, I started thinking, uh, see, we didn't want a name that would scare people off because we were doing a lot of evangelical work in the beginning. We would go out and play in a park or in a prison or a high school, uh, wherever people were. And uh, we didn't want to pe people to run away because uh, of our name. So we wanted some mystique. And uh, so we chose uh, the Greek word for rock. So um, talk then a little bit about how the four of you actually came together. Well, let's see. Uh, now, John and I were in a band over in Ohio. John came from a uh, small town outside of where I lived. And uh, we had a band, a three-piece band, uh, for a while. And actually, some of the first original songs from the Petra album were written and performed by that band. And then uh, John got the call to go to the Bible school. And uh, so it was later when I got the call and I told Greg, because Greg and I had been jamming, he would come over to my house and we would sit there and play. And I said, Greg, uh, I'm supposed to go to Bible school. And he said, well, I'll go too. And when we got there, there was, uh, lo and behold, a drummer. And uh, so we thought, hey, let's get together and jam. I remember, um, I remember meeting Greg the first time. I became a Christian in 1971, and we were having Bible studies at Bob's house in Bryan, Ohio. And there was a married couple, uh, Bill and Sandy Gonzalez, who brought Greg over to jam one time and I remember coming into Bob's house and here's this this loon <laughs> with hair down to his waist just playing shredding leads just standing there and I, I was still in high school and that was that's how I remember meeting Greg uh, he was just an incredible guitar player uh, and, and Bob is absolutely correct after I graduated ended up in, in uh, Fort Wayne Indiana at uh, Calvary Temple's uh, Christian Training Center. And I, the way I remember, the very first night I was in Fort Wayne, I met Bill at, uh, at church, at, at uh, Calvary Temple. I, I went over there for some reason and 
I believe Bill was in the basement with uh, some guys, Jack the Jardins and some other guys, and you were jamming and you asked me to jam with you. And I, I didn't have my bass with me at that moment and decided to kind of, you know, eventually, yeah, later we will. And I think it was about a month or two that. later. Pardon me? I you just remember? now remember now that you speak about it. And I think it was about a month or so after that that Bob and Greg, these two guys moved over, uh, found a house on the clear end of uh, Fort Wayne, started living together and started a, attending church and the school. And really, just like what Bob said, you know, we just started playing, just started jamming and figured, OK, we're going to do this. Let's do it. Again, I really believe it was God that brought us all four there at the same time. I don't think there was any accident there. <clears throat> it mm -hmm. was my home church, but I had been on the road already with uh, Gene Cotton and living in Nashville. Then I was before that, I was on the road with my my uncle Bob with uh, uh, Tommy Rowe and the Romans. So I had just come home because I was drafted and had to go. Uh, get my uh, physical that gave me a 4F because I'm mentally uh, unable to do things uh, that they would cry in uh, service at that time. So uh, they gave me a 4F and, and sent me on my way. And I went back home to Fort Wayne and started going to that uh, same school, the uh, Christian Training Center, because I was the drummer of that church. That was our, that was our church. And it was, it, you know, the whole timing, though, I believe was God for all four of us to be there at the same time. Amen. Yeah, let me say this. Uh, I think we were, I think it was providential as well that it was that church that we ended up in. Uh, of course, they had a coffee house ministry called the Adam's Apple, which was very big in the area very influential for Christ, all in that whole tri-state area, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio. And uh, because we were a part of that, and because we were a part of that church, which was a very progressive church, I mean, they they actually uh, let us practice in the basement. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we'd be rocking out and we'd look up and there'd be the pastor standing back in the back and he'd be nodding his head and we knew all along he was thinking, I don't understand this, but uh, I know these boys and uh, they're pretty good kids. So we'll just see what happens. And, uh, you know, because we were in an atmosphere like that, I think God allowed us to prosper because when we would go out, sometimes we would get hit with phenomenal uh, uh, opposition. And to be able to come home and know that we were uh, welcomed and thought of seriously as a ministry, I think that uh, healed a lot of the wounds we got when we went out on the road. Look at There's one thing I'd like to interject to, and I've said this during a couple of uh, Petra fan conventions. When we started, forget everything you know about Christian music. Forget that, because it didn't exist. I mean, Christian music at that time basically consisted of what was in your hymn book, uh, Southern Gospel, and church musicals written by a guy named Ralph Carmichael. <laughs> there, was just, there was basically only one band that had uh, really gotten national recognition and that was a band called love song although there were i remember bob going to california this is when i was still in in high school and when we, we were playing together 
Uh, your mother was living out there, and I remember you came back with a bunch of Maranatha albums. Very early Christian albums that were the recording technique was kind of marginal, but they were nonetheless very early albums. Um, you know, I've heard people say, well, when did Christian music start? Well, there's a whole big discussion about that. You could you could go into Britain, and in the 1960s, there was a band called The Pilgrims, which uh, put an album out, but they sort of got eclipsed by uh, a couple other British bands that were hitting the charts. <laughs> so um, who knows when Christian rock really started, but Bob is right. We got a lot of opposition because we were not, we were not what people were was used to. You know, we, we came out, we had two incredibly good lead guitarists. Bill had a, a double bass kit. I had a gigantic bass amp and we didn't, we didn't pull any punches. We just played. There's also cultural opposition a bit with just rock and roll. You know, rock and roll had this image of being anti-establishment and dangerously punk and reckless. Um, or celebrated things that were just non-Christian like well, or weren't principled and <laughs> fusing those two worlds, you know, um, from the various histories I've read relating to this subject, you know, fusing those two worlds was contentious to the public and confusing. Um, yeah, we bumped into that a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Well, you guys, you guys kind of pushed the envelope a little bit too. I mean, I, I, I listen to that first album and I hear a song like Walking in the Light. I mean, that was hard rock for the time and there were, I don't know of anybody else that early on that was doing in the Christian world doing something that heavy um so I guess uh did you have any second thoughts about trying had you guys ever heard anybody that did something heavy like that or was that just something you we were you know? we were actually Christian we were rock and rollers we were yeah. we were the we were actual rock and roll musicians. Yeah. It wasn't like we were Christian music. We were rock and roll musicians who played about Jesus. Right. Yeah. It was yeah. authentic. It, it was very original, authentic stuff. It was not uh, contrived to be any way. We tried to do certain things like that, you know, to become commercial. But the the roots of Petra is just we were all rock and rollers i listened to cream i listened to free i listened yeah. you know to bad company i you know i didn't listen to any gospel music mm -hmm. i didn't no. listen to any gospel music None and i it. think that's key to what our philosophy was starting out because we felt hey there are people like us out there who won't listen to any church music at all and what if we go out and play rock music and they'll draw a crowd and then witness our faith to them. And that was the idea behind the band, really, is to be evangelistic. And yep. it wasn't until later that Christians began to uh, buy our music and come to our concerts. And we realized, hey, there's a whole nother ministry to Christians. But uh, we started out totally evangelical. Yeah. If I may say something really quick, just to make mention, so I don't forget, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Bill, you mentioned some of the bands that had influenced you, and um, it's funny you mentioned Free, because I wrote down three bands that uh, original Petra reminded me of, and those three bands were Free, the Allman Brothers, and the James Gang, and uh, listening to, and I mean that as a compliment, because I love, I love each of those bands for different reasons. 
Um, but come and join us in the eponymous first album. I absolutely love, and something that I would like for our viewers to know, um, I'm, I have, so I, I make these little uh, musical passages, these little edits that are interspersed between the interview. And I had, I've got about 50 frames of music <laughs> that um, going through musical passages through the first two albums. And I'm like, well, I have to keep this, this is so good. And I have to keep this, this is so good. What I want you to know are our viewers out there, I'm going to put a link in the description when this episode airs, and it's going to be a supplement to this episode. And I didn't throw anything away. And the reason why I kept it all is because I would like for the viewers to listen to the, the, the free spirit and the jamming that, that quite frankly, um, are really only found on the first two albums. There was much more of a free spirit of the 70s that are encompassed in those albums. And it's amazing to me what you guys were laying down. Now, I, I first came on board with Petra. Um, Petra was the very first, um, for lack of a better term, Christian rock band that I ever encountered. And that was in 1982. Um, but I, I discovered the first two albums probably the subsequent year in 83 is when I found out about Come and Join Us in the eponymous album. But I just want to say that the free spirit and the jamming that are on the first two albums um, are just unbelievable. And so I'm putting a supplement in, and you can find it in the description below. Just amazing musicianship. Could you guys address, you know, how you were initially received by the fans who came to the shows? Um, you know, you said you got a lot of pushback from from others, but how did how did the fans receive you? They liked it. I, it was great. I mean, sure, we had trouble with a lot of pastors. I remember we used to go up to Chicago and play once every three months, and we would go up and play, and all these kids would get saved, and then they'd say, "We're going to have you back." And I remember telling him, I, I asking him, I said, well, you must really like us because you keep having us back because, and he said, no, I don't like your music at all. <laughs> he said, he said, but the kids do and they get saved. So we're going to keep asking you back. So we went up to Chicago about every three months for a while, but the kids, I think a lot of the, the kids just took to it. Really. It was the older people and the people in charge generally who didn't like what we did, but like I said, he he tolerated it because the kids got saved and he knew it. One time they sent us out in the park. Remember, they sent us yeah. up in the park. There's a bunch of church people waiting for us to play. We started playing. They all got up and left. And then all the kids that were in the park came and came and, and kids got saved. Yeah. yeah. 17. Uh -huh. We played and we drove every person out of that and you could see that the kid that the, the youth pastor and the pastor, you could see them, they had their heads bowed and the pastor was talking to him. I remember standing up there and we started playing and we played a medley. It was from the first album. And I, and I thought, oh my gosh, I said to Bob, I said, Bob, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to blow these people's minds because the people right before us was a lady singing and playing a guitar and somebody else playing piano. It was like, you know, so we got up. <laughs> And when we started that song, I remember it felt like that maybe five or six people had big five gallon cans of water and threw them on the front row. I mean, these people were just like, they just <laughs> fell backward and like, and they immediately started getting up and I started sweating. I thought, oh my gosh, what are we doing? And I kept going and I remember I said to Bob, I said, what are we supposed to do? And he said, just do what we're doing. So we just kept, we just kept playing and every person, everybody left and we're playing through this whole empty uh place and like like someone else said the kids started coming in one by one and i counted them there 80 kids came in and it was that my privilege that day to, to do a, a altar call and 17 of them came down front and gave their hearts to jesus and it was like if, if, there, if there was any doubt in my mind about what god called us to do at that day i was tested and, um, and God showed me, and nothing after that ever bothered me again.
There's another story similar to that. We were playing some, I think it was a high school auditorium. And there was a bunch of, I, I hate to say maybe there were Mennonites, it's the type of faith where the ladies wear that little covering thingy. And there was like two rows of people uh, dressed like that and very conservative. And Bill actually said something. He said, listen, if there's anybody here you don't think you're going to like rock and roll. Maybe you ought to leave now. And two of those people got up and left. <laughs> well, that was at least honest. I remember what we all felt like when we pull up to a church and start unloading our equipment. And the youth pastor would come out and say, you guys don't play loud, do you? <laughs> and they look like Mennonites. <laughs> I mean, we, we would do everything. We would put blankets over our amps. We would uh, turn our speakers around backwards. We would do anything to try to not be so loud, but there was no getting around it. We were a rock band. And when we got into the right uh, situation, that's where we could shine and where God could use us the most. But, yeah. uh, you know, it was just so hard to... Uh, try to accommodate certain situations when they didn't know what to expect at all. And I don't know why they would book us if they didn't know what to expect. But they did. I heard a lady, one, one time a lady said, no, a guy, he said, well, we didn't think you'd sound like that. And I said, well, don't you have our album? And he goes, yeah. But we didn't think you'd sound like that. I don't. He, he couldn't. He couldn't believe it. He had her album, and he still couldn't believe we did what we did on the album. It was like he. It was mystifying to us. Well, I, I, you go no ahead, Rex. Well, I I just want to say, I mean, a couple things, uh, observations. One, now fifty years later, it's it's hard to like put yourself back in there, like how churches were and just everything. And I just want to say thank you guys again, because you were true pioneers. And I'm sure that you guys took a tremendous amount of grief. And I'm sure there was some self-doubt and like, you know, just are we always just going to get beat down by all these church people who don't understand what we're trying to do? So thank you so much. It didn't help that Bob and Greg brought Marshall Snacks to the every gig. <laughs> yes. Well, there, there wasn't much else available back then. No. <laughs> and they worked well outside. Oh. <laughs> Remember when we played in Texas and they told us they could hear us eight miles away like it was next door? <laughs> yeah. Remember we played, at a K, we played at a Kmart parking lot and 800 kids showed up. And we played outside on, on a couple of flatbed trailers and they got a phone call. Someone said eight miles away, they could hear us like we were next door. <laughs> but, you know, Texas was so flat. That was yeah. Odessa, wasn't it? Huh? That was yes. Odessa, wasn't it? I don't know. Your brother set us up for that. Yeah, Midland yeah. Odessa. Yeah. Yeah. There that was a tremendous show. There was all kinds of people saved there. Yeah. That's a great church. They knew exactly what we were doing. They had us all over the radio before we got there, and their, the place was full of, of non-Christians wanting to hear uh, Petra. Yeah. During the period of the first two albums, 70, uh, 74 through 77, 78, about how far out was Petra playing, gentlemen? Were you guys were you guys getting calls to go way out of state, or did you kind of have maybe a quad state area, or how far were you guys playing out during that time? Well, that's a good question, because Bill just brought up uh, Texas, and when we drove all the way from Indiana to Texas, Ugh. that was the longest we'd ever gone anywhere. In a Plymouth duster. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. 33 hours. Yeah, yeah we were uh, 
needless to say. Uh, we, yeah. we actually, one, one time, we actually played in Western Canada uh, one year. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, that was later, wasn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. we went clear up to uh, Dawson Creek, British Columbia, yeah. which is like where the zero mile marker for the Alaskan Highway is. You're like 200 miles from the Yukon. And then we came straight south. I think we played the Seattle area or some some place, Washington, Oregon, and dropped all the way. I remember going on the Coast Highway in California and going all the way and playing Knott's Berry Farm and San Diego and Southern California. And we did some uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And we did this huge kind of tour. Now, our first gig was like in um, uh, somewhere in uh, Saskatchewan or something like that. And we wound <laughs> up coming all the way back. And it was well, like, I, didn't know. I think it was like four or five weeks. Yeah, do you remember we left our trailer in Canada? Oh, we broke down. We I broke down that. in the we broke down in the Canadian Rockies. <laughs> yeah. They were they were building they were actually building part of the road. And you would drive for like 20 miles on nice, you know, asphalt paved highway and then 20 miles on dirt. And whoever was driving uh, said, hey, the trailer's doing something weird. And so we, we got out and we looked and the, the frame had snapped and the part of the trailer was digging into the dirt and it looked like a tuna can. It just peeled back and all the gear was covered in mud and we had to abandon it. We were like a hundred miles from uh, uh, Vancouver, or what? What's the next big city there? I'm uh, blanking Prince, on geography. Prince Albert. We go went to Prince Albert. We rented a U-Haul van. Yeah. We went up, unloaded all the gear into the U-Haul van. I'm um, not van, but trailer. And then took the trailer to the border and found out. We couldn't take a Canadian U-Haul right, across right. the border. So we had to leave the trailer, Canadian trailer in Canada, go across and get an American U-Haul trailer, drive back to Canada, unload our gear from the Canadian trailer into the American trailer, and went the rest of the way on the tour. Yeah, we so didn't that have was that a day, lot of fun. Yeah, we didn't have a gig that day, and I think we spent like 500 bucks doing all that. But yeah, I'll never forget that. Jeez. I don't remember that. I'm glad I left then. I'm glad I left before that happened. <laughs> Everybody's talking about power. Power to the people that say. Talk a little bit about how the first album came about. How did you? get the record label attention and like how long did it take to record it and did you have get help from anybody other than the record label just talk about how that happened i remember nancy honeytree had went down to nashville and had hired studio musicians and had it made an album and i think it cost her thirty eight hundred dollars and um it was a good album and word records picked it up they heard it and they liked it and they bought it. And then there's this guy named Billy Ray Hearn. He called up Paul Craig and he said to, to Paul Craig, he said, we're looking for uh, other Christian artists and different things. He said, do you know anybody around where you are that, that plays music, that plays Christian music? And he said, yeah, well, there are these guys at our church. They're called Petra and uh, they play rock and roll. And he said, well, why don't you get a demo of them for us? And so, we went over to this little studio in Illinois, in Pekin, Illinois, and we made this four song demo. Paul Craig went with us, the demo was terrible. I thought, this is it, man. We're not gonna get anywhere with this. And uh, Paul Craig even played piano on it. Remember that? No. no. Yeah, he played that. the piano and he, he screwed it up. We had to go back two or three times to get him to do it right. <laughs> Where was I remember this? that. What song? Where? I remember going down to Nashville and, and and Randy Matthews being there, and then two, two uh, um, big wigs from Christian, from uh, gospel music uh, labels came out to hear us, and we and we got uh, hired that way. I don't know how yeah. did it really happen. 
that's what well, I that's what I remember too, Bill. Is that uh, they offered to do an album for us, and uh, there was some kind of catch financially to where uh, I remember when we went in the studio, we told uh, the engineer, the person who ran the studio, that they could do, we would do it there, but they'd have to do it for free. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so. All they we did was buy the tape, like 600 bucks or something for the tape, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dr. Greg, did I did I hear you correctly? Did you say that you all had recorded a four song demo? Yeah, over in in Pekin, Illinois. And as far as I remember, they sent that uh, tape in, and I thought this is the end of our music career. And then the next <laughs> thing you know, Billy Ray Hearn and a couple other guys came to hear us play at the at the Adams Apple when they were in that garage type thing. And I remember standing there, I couldn't believe it. They wanted to use this after hearing that uh, demo. You remember when when Billy Ray Hearn came to the Adams Apple, and and we played in front of about sixty or seventy people, and they were there, and it was like, oh my gosh, this is really going to happen. Huh. No, I, I don't remember. remember. <laughs> I, don't remember I don't remember that. I don't remember uh, that. So that begs the question, if I may ask, do any of you gentlemen still have that four song demo or those songs from that demo? I don't even remember that we did a demo. I, I yeah. do. I, I do remember going to Pekin to do a demo. I don't remember four songs, but I remember we did it. Well, yeah. that's when we recorded the album. No. Yes. no we, we actually went down there to do a demo and only did a we couple of first. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure of that. Greg's right about that. But as far as... I just don't remember it. My thought is that um, the thing with uh, going to Nashville and dealing with some of the people that Randy Matthews knew. Yeah. That's how the, the deal came about through Paul Craig Pano, who was the assistant pastor of our church and technically our manager at that time. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that begs the question because yeah, boy, four old guys with different memories here. It's going to be. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I think it would be all. They all kind of inter they all go together though to make one thing. I think all of what everybody said is was part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when when we went down there to uh, Nashville, we were kind of courting Randy Matthews. We'd been to his house and everything. We we're kind of courting him to be lead singer, or he was courting us to be his backup band or both. Right, I don't know. right, right, right. That's exactly right. Yeah. I'm curious to know whatever maybe became of those four songs. And because, boy, <laughs> you talk about a collector's item. Uh, I am too. <laughs> as far as getting to hear those. But I also would like to ask, the way I understand it, gentlemen, for the, um, the Come and Join Us album, and this was a special release put out by Wounded Bird Records of your first two albums in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, Killing My Old Man, the way I understand it, that song was originally recorded for the Come and Join Us album. And yet, um, I'm not sure who, who nixed it, but uh, at, at the record label, they would not allow that song to be included for Come and Join Us. And as we all know, it was later re-recorded and put on uh, Never Say Die. But gentlemen, is there an official studio recording from you guys, the original Petra, that was done for the Come and Join Us album? Somewhere. So, <laughs> what, what, what I, where I'm going is, you know, oh, gentlemen, uh, you know, in, in commemorating 50 years of Petra and the wonderful classic album, Come and Join Us, is there any way, Mr. Bob, I don't know who has that recording, but is there any way that there could be a commemorative edition of Come and Join Us with the original 
killing my old man included in the song lineup. That would be something that Petra fans would treasure. Not going to happen. Yeah, I seriously doubt if you could find it anywhere. Yeah. I mean, word would have dumped stuff. Uh, they would have burned it. Yeah. <laughs> you oh. know, we <laughs> wanted to call the second album Killing My Old Man. And uh, record label said, no, no, no. In fact, we don't even want that song on the album. So we said, okay, let's call it God Gave Rock and Roll to You. No, 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 no. We can't do that. And so finally, somebody came up with Come and Join Us. So, yeah, the label, they didn't know what to do with us. They didn't know how to market us. They were trying to get Christian bookstores to stock our album. And there yeah. were Christian bookstores that said, no way, I'm not uh, I'm not going to put this kind of rock music in our Christian bookstore. We were already controversial. We didn't need a song like that or an album like that. But, yeah, that but, but we were so naive. Think of it. We were so naive, we didn't even realize it. <laughs> you know? I was familiar with the song God Gave Rock and Roll to You by Argent, but you guys certainly uh, made it your own with the arrangement that you put on it. It's so beautiful at the beginning and the build and um, Curtis was actually, he was shaking his head agreeing with me. It's so almost, almost orchest or orchestral in its arrangement. Um, I would like to know whose idea was that to bring that song to the table and you guys certainly rework the lyrics. Um, I know the record label had some opposition to it, but how did you guys say, hey, because, you know, that was actually probably the first Christian rock anthem that was ever made uh, out there. How, whose idea was it to include that? It was Dan, Bob's Dan, Dan Brock. Dan Brock, yeah. The Dan Brock? Yep. yep. Oh. his idea. I was Dan Brock, yeah. He knew that I thought song. It was, yeah. I thought you did that, Bob. No, I didn't even know that song. Okay. Dan, Dan Brock brought it. Well, and, and, and Vincent, Vince DePaul. Yes. Remember Vince DePaul? Yeah. He Back was uh, he was Sticks manager. He became a Christian, and uh, I don't know how he heard about us, but we started working with Brock and DePaul at that point in time. And yeah, it was Brock who said, "You guys need to check this out and maybe do it." Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, just just FYI, guys. Uh, Vince DePaul, do you, do you guys remember Vince? Yeah. 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 He, uh, I'm still in contact with Vince. In fact, uh, really? we're going to be going over uh, to Nashville uh, to have lunch with him and his wife uh, oh. in September. Tell him and hello. He's, he's <laughs> still totally on fire for God. It's really, uh, it's really wonderful to see. Don't please hi. Yeah, I will. Yeah. That'd be cool. Another thing about uh, uh, God Gave Rock and Roll to You, um, this was the first time that uh, we ever got to hear uh, Greg X. Voles doing lead vocals for a Petra song. Um, and of course, he also did Woman Don't You Know on that album. Um, talk to us a little bit about how that came about, that he first guest vocals for the band. We knew him. I actually, he was in a band. I knew the guy that was in a band with Greg before Petra even started, but I heard, I knew of him and saw him once, but we had considered, I, I had thought about him a long time ago, but then you see, I think we all thought none of us could sing that well. We did it on the first album, but we really felt like we needed a good singer to take us a little to the next step higher, if I'm not mistaken, if any, everybody else agrees with that. And somehow Greg Bolson's name came up again and uh, 
that's what I that's what I remember. It was just that we knew him and we knew of him, but his name came up, and uh, I don't know how we got him after that. Well, he was pretty tight. He was pretty tight with the guys from the studio too. The guys from Golden Voice. Uh, was what, that it? Yes. Harry Jameson was that the one dude's name? And they were they were friends, if I remember right. Yes. He had a and band called E Band. Right. Yeah. E, right. E yeah. Band. That's right. The guy that wrote, the guy that was the drummer wrote the coloring song, which actually, uh, in my opinion, was the song that uh, broke up wide open for Petra as far as as uh, contemporary Christian music being the our music Petra uh, being Christian rock previously. To then it became that's more M O R, you know, and all of a sudden it's on the airwaves, and then Petra. I think that's when Petra started to be well known. Uh, throughout the music industry then. Yeah, it sure helped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They no. even wrote that song, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I want to mention another song that didn't make either of the first two albums, and that's Rockin' On With Jesus. <laughs> now, there is a live recording of you guys doing that song that's out there on YouTube. People can hear it. And it's a great song. And I guess I'm just curious why it never got on either of those first two albums. Who knows? <laughs> I think we thought it was it was pretty raw. I, yeah. I I I remember coming up with part of the words, and I and and this may this is my memory, okay? So forgive me. But I remember going to Bob, and and uh, I I remember my words. I had I had a secondhand Bible from a Salvation Army store. And the clothes on my back and what's more. Since I've been rocking with Jesus, I don't really need me too much more. And then Bob came in and, and I, I, he wrote the other verse. Mama, Papa told me, son, uh, don't mess with Satan and, and his tricks. Bob had that part and we put it together and made a song out of it. I, faced, I basically came to him with the, with the idea and he and I sat down and he finished it with me. That's yeah, what I, I don't. I don't even remember that, Greg. I don't. Even, I don't remember coming up with the second verse, but that's maybe so. You know. No. <laughs> I don't remember there. why we didn't record it though, because or maybe we did. I don't remember. But we had a lot of songs we had to choose from. Yeah. Well, yeah, we used to do a couple of Larry Norman songs. Yeah. 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 So I would like to ask, gentlemen, if y'all don't mind. Um, <clears throat> Of course, Dr. Greg, you and Mr. Bob both played guitar, lead guitar, and the music, of course, was wonderful. Um, there are passages, John, when your bass just shines through, and then, uh, you know, Mr. Bill, is it is it Woman Don't You Know? You had the extended drum solo on the album. Um, and I know, Dr. Greg, that you either wrote or co-wrote with Mr. Bob. There's Wake Up, I'm Not Ashamed, Woman Don't You Know, Sally, and Without You. All to say, gentlemen, how did you all go about presenting a song to a band? Like, Dr. Greg, if you had the song, or Mr. Bob, how did Petra at that time, did y'all just show up for practice? And one of y'all say, hey, guys, I have an idea for a song. And we all how lived did the song develop? We all lived together. Yeah. Everything was, we all lived together every I didn't actually live with them because I was still living with my mom, but I was over there all the time, and we just sat around and do that stuff. A lot. Of, see, Bob and I did a lot of double leads together and all that. So he would come with yeah. come to me with an idea, and we would sit down. I was just glad to do anything. So if Bob came to me with a song, we'd just figure it out. It was a lot of fun. We spent a many, 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 many hours doing learning all those double leads and and coming up with the parts together. So just yeah. kind of, a lot of it happened because Bob and I, ever since we started, when we went to Bible school, we, we had an apartment and Bob and I always lived together all those first years. And so we were always available to each other to have things and to do things. That's right. Well, yeah, you can tell too. The instrumentation truly is remarkable. And that's why friends, I'm gonna put in the description, a little supplement if you want to go to that link whenever this airs and listen to the song craft that these guys were laying down. It truly is remarkable. And friends, you have to remember, this is the early 
to mid seventies and so, so competent. I mean, you know, sometimes people want to poo poo bands because they have Christian lyrics, but these guys were the real deal. Petra was the real deal. They always have been. Well, and again, the version of God Gave Rock and Roll to You that you guys did, to me, that is hands down the best version that's ever been made. Um, the, the instrumentation, the whole arrangement, it's just outstanding. I, uh, you know, whether it's Kiss or Argent or whatever, uh, I have never heard a version better than the one you guys did. Well, even the reprise of that is very, yeah, yeah. I even like the reprise uh, that's on there at the end, too. That's great also. I remember that somehow in my mind, I thought, wouldn't it be neat if we could have a little kid sing on this song? And somebody came up with a little kid. <laughs> she got up there, she sang, but there was, only just, there was just only a few of us. So she sang and then she sang again, she sang and then she sang again. And then we all got there and we sang and we kept singing over and over and over and over again, all over the top of it until there was all these people, but it was just us four or five people with that little girl singing. No, well, okay. Didn't Steve, Steve Camp sing on that so album too? Or Yes. Well, it's in the credits, Greg, that Steve Camp did percussion and sang. Yes. Yeah. yeah it, but <laughs> I don't remember that. Yeah, remember that little girl that came in and started out oh, on the replays? Absolutely. She came yeah. to one of our concerts later as a grown-up woman. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's right. You're right. You're right. Wow. Wow. Remember Jeez. me? No. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was great. Speaking of concerts, um, and Rex, Rex, help me out, buddy, because I would, sure. one of the questions we wanted to ask, gentlemen, I know that, and again, we are celebrating 50 years of Petra. And uh, just congratulations to, to, uh, to all of Petra. And you guys were the foundational members. We love each and every one of you and are grateful for the ministry that you all have had and it's ministered to us. Rex, I know that Petra will be playing, performing, and I believe it's also going to honor the original members. When is that? Yeah, I believe it's Saturday, August 20th at Buck Lake Ranch in Angola, Indiana. Um, at the Campfire Festival. Is that correct, guys? Are you going to do a couple yep. songs? That's correct. right. Okay. Awesome. awesome. Can you reveal yep. which songs that, that you all will be playing from the original Petra lineup? Yeah, we're going to do Get Back to the Bible. Nice. Very nice. That's the easiest one for us. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and you guys also, because I've seen some pictures, was it in the earlier 2000s that you guys actually got together and played a few songs too? Yeah, yes. 2005. Okay. Now, did we, do, did we do rock songs when we did that? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Was that at the Adam's Apple? No, no. It, was at the, it was at the Assembly of Gods on the bypass. We did about three or four songs, but we did Lucas McGraw last, and then... Mm. Everybody died. <laughs> okay. There, there is a video on YouTube from that, um, and it's actually uh, "Walking in the Light" that you guys play on the video. And Bob, you were playing slide guitar on there, which uh, I, I was really thrilled to see because I, I don't think I'd ever seen you play slide guitar before. That um, was in Enid, Oklahoma. Okay. All right. That's where that was taped. Okay. That was um, our first. Uh, that was the first time we had a reunion, same year, and then later on that we had the other one in November in Fort Wayne. Okay, all right.
Hey, since somebody mentioned Lucas McGraw, maybe we should talk about that. Um, <laughs> whose idea was that? It was Bob's. It was Bob's. Bob's. Bob picked up a banjo. I don't know if I played mandolin first or you played banjo first. Or we, I, if I, I don't even know if I learned to play mandolin because you played banjo. I don't remember. I think but, it was the same time, Greg. Okay. I think we just said, I'm, I'm going to try banjo and you try mandolin. Right. Okay. That's... Now, the reason, the reason we did it, tell them why. Why did we do a bluegrass set? So we could go and, and go to a church on a Sunday morning and play and not scare them to death. Was that it? That yeah. was part of it, yes. <laughs> but also, it was a comedy sketch. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you're right. We would do, like, we would do rock and we'd be scaring them to death. They'd be halfway out of their seat to their car. And we'd pick up the bluegrass instruments and start clowning around. And they come back. And once you make them laugh, you got them for the rest of the night. Then they right. trusted us. We could do whatever we wanted. Right. It worked like a charm. <laughs> that was genius. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we did a bunch of different songs and we all put them together. We did... I, we did like what would a Petra be? What would a Kristen be? Oh if yeah, that was that? another thing. Yeah, you did That's a surf. The there was a surf tune. There was a surf tune and a 1950s tune. Yeah, and yeah. a soul. That was a, a soul. different skit. Yeah. yeah, that was a different skit. Yeah, yeah that was right. a different skit. Yeah. Is there yeah. any video of this stuff that you guys are referring to? Because this would be awesome to see now. No, <laughs> this was before video. It was okay. dinosaurs. <laughs> Dinosaurs were roaming. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, there might nobody not be the video. But... Us, and nobody was certainly wasn't videotaping us. <laughs> Gentlemen, I would like to ask really quick, and I know I've kind of asked earlier, but, you know, I, I just didn't know if any of you all had a clean copy of the original Killing My Old Man or any nice live recordings Um I just know that you guys, the foundational members of Petra, to me, and, and again, I love all of Petra, and I celebrate you guys, and I give thanks to the Lord, and thank you, gentlemen, for being the vessels that you've been for the Lord, and we give all the glory to him, um, but, you know, the music that you guys were laying down is certainly special. It's one of a kind. There's so much there. Where else did you get the twin leads in any Petra albums? It's the first two albums. Do you gentlemen have any clean live recordings or just a clean copy of the original Killing My Old Man? I feel like fans would be so delighted just to be able to reconnect with the original version of Petra and the music that you guys were laying down. Do you all have well, any archival well, recordings? Well, Al Horning, our sound man, used to record us a lot. And I think, yeah. I think that Al Horning has has some uh, recording. Huh? He would tape us on reel to reel. Yeah, you remember that, Bob? Al Horning would tape us. We would play. I remember when we played with uh, the Talbot Brothers. Uh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Al would record, and I think that I remembered somewhere in my past that Al had a bunch of recordings of us. Do you guys remember Phil Snyder? Across oh, the yeah. Yeah, open yeah. door. Yeah. He recorded every single show that ever happened there. I mean, there's like rare Phil Kagey things. Right. And I'm pretty sure he might have something. Well, he I mean, did record us over there for sure. Yeah, he recorded did we, every did single Did we ever thing. play at the open door though? Oh yeah. In Hickson. Yeah. yeah. Remember when we went over there to play? <laughs> and and I and I and Phil Kagey was there. The place was packed. Do you remember that? And I got up and I told about how I was practicing all week before we got up. I didn't say it that oh, was way. Was that there? Was that, that there? That was there. Yeah, okay. Okay. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. And they, and they accused you of doing yes. that on purpose. Right. Yeah. They wouldn't okay. believe that you didn't know what you were saying. I didn't. That's... See... I knew we were going to play at the open door, and I and we love I loved that place because everybody knew us and liked us. So I practiced all week long, every day. I really practiced by myself and really learned it. So we had 
choreographed the show so each person had a time that they would say something. I don't know if you should have this on air or not. I'll just say Go for it. it. They'll edit. So anyway, so it was my turn to get up to, to, to say something, and the room was just electric, and Phil Kiggy was there, and everybody was so excited. And I got up and I said, it's so good to be here, to be here tonight. I said, I've been sitting at home playing with myself all week long, getting ready for tonight. <laughs> and the place went dead quiet. And one, and, one, and one at a time, they started to laugh. And I was so humiliated. Oh, geez. I was, I was, totally, I was totally, completely humiliated. And, now, and they, they accused him of doing that on purpose. Yes. Yeah. That's and I great. promised. That was the last time on my mind. <laughs> Anybody would know you, but know you didn't do it on purpose, but they didn't know you. I'm away. Wake up. I'd like to recap really quick, though, if you don't mind, with, with each of you uh, about, about where you are at currently. Um, Mr. John... I know that Salt is due for a third album. Uh, Curtis will be playing drums on it. I believe that Dr. Greg would be uh, guessing on some more guitar. Yeah, I got something for him to do, yeah. When might that album be released, and do you have a title for that? Uh, I do have a working title I don't want to say right now, uh, but um, the way things are going, there's just been family considerations and just it's just been taking a long time to get everybody together to rehearse. Probably a year from now. Okay. The way and the latest release, and it also features, again, John Schlitt uh, guessing no. on some lead vocals. <laughs> no, um, uh, it does. I Well, the latest release does, mm -hmm. but the new one will not. Right. Uh, we are going to be using uh, Mr. Sean Browning as, as vocalist. Yes. And I was referring to trophy hunting for unicorns. John Schlitt does guess yes. vocal yes, on, that. on that one. Yes. And I'll put the description to pick that up in the link. So... Um, Thank you. And then, Mr. Bill, you're still rocking and rolling with Bandana. Yep. Still going fact, strong. I got a show. As soon as I get off of here, I got to go out to the uh, to the bay and uh, set up. And we'll be playing right on the water tonight from 7 to 10 o'clock. Nice. Very nice. Hey. Dr. Hey. Greg, are you are you're still picking and grinning? I know, right? And cracking backs. Yep. Yep. I, I practice. Uh, right now, I've spent the last few years learning 30s, 40s, and 50s jazz and singing it and playing jazz guitar. And it's just been a real passion for me. Wonderful. Now, are you are, are you in any specific bands playing jazz? I was with a guy for a long time. We called it Take Two. And there are just two of us. And uh, I, I took band in the box and, and laid down all of the tracks, and they, except for the drums and myself. And so we had a bass and piano and because in Fort Wayne, they pay 150 bucks if there's one of you or if there's five of you. So we figured out if, we, if I recorded all the background, we could get up and sing and play and everybody liked it. So we, we did a lot of that. Wonderful, wonderful. Mr. Bob, uh, what about you, sir? I know that uh, you're always busy. What's, what's on your radar as far as any music is concerned? As far as any music is concerned, well, right now I'm trying to, remember all the Petra songs for the 20th and because uh, we haven't done anything with Petra for uh, almost two years now. So I have to go through all that and get my chops up to make sure I can cover it. And uh, musically, I mean, the last really recording thing I did was uh, I did a album with a, uh, a local uh, former missionary who plays classical guitar. And uh, he had released, it's kind of a long story, but he's released several albums in support of a missionary uh, retreat that's here where I live. And um, so they asked me if I would uh, perform and uh, write some songs there, instrumental songs. So we did an album, uh, we call it Guitar Legacy. The uh, gentleman who played a uh, classical guitar has since passed on uh, and uh, it's a sad thing there but uh, the album has done real well for them and uh, completely uh, 
for uh, the missionary uh, cause there. And uh, so that's the last recording I did. Now, Bob, I've, I've read on Facebook that you guys are, I believe the current lineup with Petra is working on putting together a little tour for the fall. Is that accurate? Yeah, okay. we sure are. We want to celebrate 50 years as much as we can. <laughs> okay. And that is just the current lineup that's doing that, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Gentlemen, that's, again, thank each of you for being here, um, Rex and Mike and I. We give all glory to the Lord, but Petra was the very first band that introduced us to great music, rock and roll, with a Christian message. And we give all the glory to the Lord for his abundant life and his gifts, the music being one of those uh, gifts from the Father of the Heavenly Lights. Um Thank you all so much. And we just wish to celebrate with you the 50 years of Petra, you all being the foundational members of that band. And we always like to close each episode with a, a scripture closeout. And I'm going to read from the word really quick, if you all don't mind. And um, after, I, after we dismiss, please hang around for one more moment after we finish recording. But today's scripture closeout, it comes from 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 and 11. And I was reminded of this verse of scripture because you all have been so faithful um, since the inception of Petra, being the foundational members. Uh, you guys have always presented the good news of Christ. And here's what, the first, here's what 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11 says. Using the grace God gave me, I laid a foundation like a skilled master builder, and another man is building on it. But let each one be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus the Christ. And since the beginning of Petra, you guys have presented the good news of Jesus the Christ. And I know it's blessed so many people, and you all were the vessels the Lord initially began using through Petra. And we just want to say thank you. And we give all glory to the Lord and celebrate the 50 years of Petra. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. And, and actually, before we depart, I, I'd like to give each of you, if you'd like to, uh, if you've got any last thought or uh, thing you'd like to express to the fans of uh, Petra or any of the other groups that you've been part of, um, just any last thoughts you'd like to express before we end the interview today. Just glad to be part of it. Yeah, it was a real honor and a privilege to be part of it. Yeah, on a personal front here, I can say that it's been comforting to see um, credit due to the original members um, and people still trying to honor the the source of it all. You know, Petra is such a um, ubiquitous name in relationship to, um, yeah, there you go, Ken. So, I mean, the name is so ubiquitous to Christian rock and the legacy of, of um, popular Christian music that it's just, um, yeah, it's just really comforting as, as John, you know, one of my greatest friends. It's really comforting and exciting to see people still caring about the, um, the origins and celebrating it. And um, 50 years is a number that's, you know, twice my age and it's a number that's hard to grasp, but it's... Um, I can't wrap my head around 50 years. That just... <laughs> Yeah, I mean the the number is <laughs> the number is so remarkable, and it's just I'm chuffed to see you know like the old the, old, the come and join us shirt that uh, Rex has on, and you know yeah, unbelievable, right? I just I love to see the, the old logos and the just um again just um honoring the legacy of it all, and yeah, it's a very special thing. Well, I'm just happy that we're all still living above ground. <laughs> <That's true>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Nowhere to go but up, Mr. Bob. It only gets better from here, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, shoot. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Um, I just want to say for the record that when this came out in 1974, I was three years old. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> let it be known. But, gentlemen, you guys have certainly blessed us. We give all glory to the Lord. And thank you so much for joining us today. It was a blessing and a privilege to be able to fellowship with each of you. Thank you so much. We'll wave Keep goodbye to our friends. No, Mr. Bill, what'd you say? Keep rocking on with Jesus. That's right. We'll say goodbye to our friends, but please stick around for one more minute. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Rock and roll.